When I worked for the walkers, I took care of the horses at night. My name is Mona Smith. I used to be Mona Chase back when I worked at Steel Hill and lived there. It was beautiful there and they had the swimming pool out behind. That's still, you still have the same swimming pool out there behind the end part. And we would carry people's luggage in. I sometimes did that because if I was hanging around, they put me to work. <laughs> and um, the rooms were Victorian. The, there was a big, huge dormitory at the top. And sometimes, like once we had a barely bad snowstorm predicted, so they asked all the workers to come and stay, to bring our pajamas, plan on sleeping there, and we all slept upstairs in the dormitory. There was the ski slope with the rope toe, um, golf course, pool tables, and there was a place downstairs where they would sometimes have a band. The rooms were beautiful. There was dining because I, for a very short time, I tried to waitress, but I was too shy. I couldn't handle it. <laughs> it was scary for me. It was probably a great place to go for a honeymoon, you know, because it was beautiful. Benjamin Steele and his sons actually spent a fair bit of time prospecting for gold and silver on the Steele Hill property. And in fact, visitors today can still find evidence of their activities, though sadly, gold and silver are not to be found in paying quantities any longer. By the early 1900s, the Steel Hill Farm was in the hands of a noted Boston attorney, Charles Tyler, and much of the information we have about the property comes from a history he wrote. After the death in 1931 of Charles Tyler, the property was purchased by a noted Boston jeweler, Nelson Smith, in 1937. Mr. Smith purchased the property because he was an active outdoorsman, loved the views on the hill, and with a view to becoming a gentleman farmer in the Lakes region. When I was young, the town of Samerton probably had 600 and something people. We had a lot of summer residents. It was very quiet the rest of the year. I used to play in the road. That's how quiet it was, on a tar road. Also, we only had two dump trucks, one for one side of the town, one for the other side of the town. So if the road got icy, there was a man that stood in the back of the truck and shoveled dirt out as they drove. And if you lived on a dirt road, you didn't get plowed for three days, maybe, and you didn't have to go to school. <laughs> on September 21st, 1938, the great hurricane struck New England. The high winds took down much of the timber on the front side of the inn where the current golf course is located. Mr. Nelson had long wanted to build an inn to take advantage of the wonderful views on top of the hill. And with the reclaimed lumber, the inn was built and finished within a matter of years. It was a good way to use up the hurricane uh, blowing uh, trees that had fallen over. I'm nearly sure um, I've been in, living in Sandmonton for about 65 years. I was postmaster for 30 years at the Sandmonton Post Office and brought up six children. We we had our barn uh, blow off the top of the barn, the uh, roof, yes, and uh, uh, it took five months before we got any power. Official records at the Weather Bureau in Concord show sustained winds of 56 miles per hour, but around the state, gusts nearing 100 miles per hour were reported. The Merrimack River rose nearly 11 feet above flood stage and the Hanover Gazette reported that in New Hampshire, 60,000 people were homeless and many areas were without power. Yeah, I was only eight years old and I can remember the neighbor came walking up crying and she had put candles in her windows to feel better, I guess. It was started in the afternoon and went all night. I was able to sleep, but boy in the morning, Things looked mighty different. <laughs> These years after the hurricane, the economy was still in the throes of depression following the difficult times in the 1930s. So the construction of the inn, which stretched from 1938 until June 1941, occupied many local residents and was a great boon to the local economy. By 1941, the original Steel Hill Inn was completed. It is now the site of the current restaurant. And it's a nice place to eat 
and uh, I was there for my birthday, the brunch. I'd like to go again. And all oh, the, the scenery, the peacefulness, the, I can go down in my woods here and, and I have a nice view from my window. All the mountains up north and here's our stop in the west. I think that's west. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's a good place to live. The inn was opened with a view to providing retreats in the countryside for affluent Boston families. I believe I went there to get a job because I heard they had horses and I wanted to know if they wanted somebody to take out the trail rides. And they hired me. The walkers, it was Nancy and Jerry Walker. And I took care of their horses and took out trail rides when I got out of my regular job. So I did nights and weekends. And they had children and I had fun with them. And well, my sister-in-law, uh, was hired by Nelson Smith to take care of the uh, horses back uh, when he was the owner of the inn. And uh, she did her chores in the morning and and uh, got on the, one of the best horses and rode to Plymouth. Plymouth's fair was on and she wanted to be in some of those contests because they were very good horses. And I love the barn. It was rugged, really well built. As you see, it's still standing and looks really good. And I lived on the end, the south end, in the corner that you can see from the road, and there was a big room in there. In 1965, things changed somewhat when the Conklin family, the new owners, decided to market the property to the general public. In 1968, Ralph Cotillo, a former naval aircraft carrier pilot from Taunton, Mass, was inspired by the views from the hill and purchased the property. It was the most fun place I ever lived.